ambulances have just arrived at once. So why is this the witching hour? I don't know. I don't know. Late afternoon and seven ambulances are suddenly stacked up outside. Should we offload into direct into number seven for me, please? That's an idea. Thank you. COVID hospital admissions may have dipped slightly this week. But glimpse into Barnet A&E for a reality check. We're still in the thick of a crisis. How do you feel at the end of a shift? Knackered. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And at the beginning of a shift? Knackered. Domestic worker Larissa Atanasova, renowned in the hospital for her machine-like efficiency, can barely clean the bays quickly enough. They call every two minutes. What do you can do? Nothing. The next patient is coming. She's right. Two minutes later, 52-year-old Davian Hunt arrives. What were your symptoms? I could barely walk. Yeah, lack of energy. I'm tired. I just want to sleep all the time. Yeah. Mm. Another patient, arrived by ambulance, has gone to the resus area. He's quite a sad story. His wife died on Friday oh. of COVID while he was being treated in here. Oh, my God. Enough. One, two, three. 63-year-old post office cleaner Felix Ramet lost his wife four days ago. <coughs> now he has dangerously low oxygen levels. This is going to be a little bit tighter, but it will help you to breathe. Breathe, OK. Perfect. Nurses say this CPAP machine is like sticking your head out of a car window at 90 miles an hour and opening your mouth. Is it coming up? Yeah, it is coming up. So it's kind of What's the pressure's been like over the last two months here in a They've been intense. I'm personally just back from having COVID. So it's been a hard struggle. I'm weak, I'm tired, but I'm back here. We're busy, we're full every day. We're struggling, but we're getting through it. We have good support here. So you caught it yourself? Yeah. Probably working here, right? Yeah. Because I'm, I'm, you had it as well? <laughs> yeah. I survived the first wave, but I managed to get it in this wave. About seven of us went off at the same week. So having seen what COVID could do, people coming in here day after day, when you got it yourself, it must oh. have been scary. Oh, I was absolutely terrified. I was in hysterics on the phone ringing in here. Felix, how do you feel? For Felix, there's grief and terror. And he's not just lost his wife. His 40-year-old son-in-law is also in the hospital on a ventilator. In COVID wards like this one, recovery is uncertain. But all the same, unconscious patients are being prepared for it. We're now going to bend this left arm up. Touch your chin. Physiotherapist Claire is doing what's called ranging, making sure the patient's joints don't stiffen up so movement will come back more easily. Do, do you know whether they can hear you? Um, I just couldn't. Sometimes you hear from our previous survivors, like they, they say they remember like hearing accents rather than actual words, but I just think. You know, this is, you know, he's a person. I'm going to tell him what I'm doing. So we're going to burn that up. Lovely. Can't let these knees hit, get stiff. Sometimes it's easy to forget that the people doing this kind of work are day in, day out, absorbing the horror of what's happening in the room. You're working in an environment where uh, it's pretty much unprecedented numbers of people dying. Yeah. And I just wonder how that feels for you. Um, it's, I think this sounds silly, but the worst thing is when we do our ward books in the morning and it's when the amount of RIPs outnumbers the ones that have made it down to the wards. And I think that's when it really kicks in. And they're a lot younger in the first wave, sorry. I remember thinking that could be mum, that could be my aunt. And now I'm thinking that could be me, that could be my brother, my boyfriend. So yeah, it's it's hard. And you're you're, see, you're seeing those people every day that you're working on, and, and and really noticing the difference in their age. Yeah, they're a lot younger this time. We we lost people in their thirties, in their forties. 
it was heartbreaking. <laughs> then it was straight back to work. Sorry. Tender care in a brutal environment. Normality a world away. But where possible, it is invited in by FaceTime. At Barnet's sister hospital, the Royal Free, the family of one patient on an intensive care ward allowed us to let you hear a video call. Hey, Dad. I know you can hear us. You can see your eyes opening. So many people have just been asking about you. He can hear. He can hear. Really He's opening so his good. eyes. He can hear us. So many people love you so much. If only love and hope could cure. But in this alien environment, he does react to the familiar voices. So lovely to see you. Really, really lovely to see you. Even as they speak, in the bay opposite, another patient is lost. The porters have come to take a man in his early 60s to the mortuary. You've got a family over here yeah. talking to a loved one. Yeah. And then you're at the same time, you've got someone being wheeled yeah. out who's just yeah. died, who presumably you, you've been caring for. Yeah. So How does that feel? It's really upsetting. I think on a, on a sort of a daily level, you're sort of having to talk to families and reassure them, but at the same time you might have patients that are really sadly passing away in literally the bay opposite, and it's just trying to, I think, shield that from patients and families and try and make things look as normal as, as possible, but it, it's really difficult. But it's yeah. not normal? No, this is not normal. This is not normal at all. But these are the moments that make it worthwhile. Squeeze my hand again. Squeeze them tight. In another intensive care unit, two floors above, Dima Hooper is waking up. Give her a thumbs up then. Oh, What's her name? Well, you can hear me really well. Oh, fantastic. 53 years old, she's an NHS caterer for patients on wards. We don't want most of our patients to be fully anaesthetised. We want them to be able to squeeze hands, stick their tongue out, show that they're there, wriggle a little bit. So what we're doing there is moving from um, a ventilator that does everything for her to a situation where now she decides when she breathes. This was last week. A week on, there's more progress. It must be nice to be just sat up and out of the bed. Yeah, you're feeling a lot better. Yeah, it, we'll, we look forward to when we can talk to you properly. Two days, and then you'll be able to talk. Oh, OK, I won't push it. But you've been walking today. Yesterday you started walking. Amazing, amazing. You are incredible. You look strong. Last week we showed you the moment Nikolai Yusachi first responded to his daughters after 40 days on a ventilator. He's a miracle. We just thank to God. A week on, he was getting ready to walk. Are you feeling strong? You feeling ready? Yep. Yep. Okay, are you ready? Off we go. I was really taken back by how many people were so debilitated, like not just physically, but we deal a lot with the cognitive side of things and we'd have patients who were like hugely, you know, independent, like running their own businesses, lawyers, who actually were really confused and, and couldn't manage to do basic tasks. It's like a marathon, yeah, that you have to train for. That's what we explain it to the patients that are Samaritan or sprints. The same could be said for the work being done by medics. Like Nikolai, their progress is slow and exhausting, but driven by hope. Jason Farrell, Sky News.